This series is all about how do I follow Christ? It's just the simple things. And what we're doing is we're looking at the Bible. If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. That's where we're going to be to there. It's going to take me a little while before I get there. But go ahead and turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. And I want to begin with this particular question just to help us uh, get there. What's the most valuable thing in your life that has no money attached to it? What's the most valuable thing in your life that has no money attached to it? Go ahead and yell out your answer. Your faith, Jesus, that's the easy one. Good job, and that's the right answer. Way to go, Tom. Now, beyond that, what is it? Yeah, you might want to say your spouse right now, guys. Like, look to you. Yeah, it's you. You say, say it to her real quick. It's you. Okay. What else? Your kids. What else? Your grandchildren. Yep, grandma, right? Yep, that's important. Is that before kids? Or, no, we won't, we won't go there. Okay. What else? Say again. Papas, oh yeah, grand, yeah, grandparents are very important. What else? That's right, dogs are very important, okay? Now I'm gonna show you the most valuable people in my life in a little video, tri- or a little video, a little picture tribute. Here we go, this is picture number one. That's the most valuable person in my life besides Christ. That's on our wedding day almost 25 years ago. Don't I look young in that bit? What happened? You know, it's just like, oh my gosh, she still looks great. Then as time goes on, she's still the most valuable person in my life apart from Christ. I absolutely am madly in love with my wife. Now, as time goes on, we had some additions to the family. We had two boys, White Sox fans. Very important, okay? You gotta raise them right. If you wanna raise your kids to be Cubs fans, that's okay. It's not not a problem. It's the wrong way, but, it, but I, anyway, I, it, so we raised them up that way, and then as they got older, we got another boy in the household, and that's our dog, Rascal. Yes, we did have a birthday party for him. That's his one-year-old birthday party. He's got the hat on. He's a good dog, and he was with us for fif- almost 15 years, all the way to my time where my kids were growing up. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. As I've gotten older, I've come to understand how important people are. It's everything. Nothing else matters but people. Money's going to come, it's going to go. Things are going to come, they're going to go. But people matter. Now I'll show you a picture of my uh, original family. That's my mom and dad. Aren't they good looking people? They're watching right now. My dad and mom always, hey, good job. You can give me a scorecard every single week. It's great. They watch on delay. Uh, that's my brother on the side. You'll notice that I've got my tippy toes up because I am taller than him. But in the picture, I want to make sure everybody knows that I, actually he might have his tippy toes on on that one, but I am taller. And then that's my sister. And for those of you who don't know, she's also our worship leader. And those are very, very important people. Uh, very important. We have another picture that I couldn't find in the, in the timeline that I had, but it shows the picture of my brother and his wife, Raylena, and their five children. And my sister and her husband, Luke, and their two children, and Rochelle and our two boys, and my mom and dad, all together. And these are the most valuable people in my life. And then you go on to the church family and different things, and and there's people that are valuable. Did you know that if you were to ask God, who's the most valuable person in your life, he'd say you. He'd say you. If uh, God has a refrigerator, your picture is on it. That's what Max Lucado said years ago. I love that particular statement. And here's the truth of the scripture. Let's go to 1 Peter. Remember I said go to 1 Peter chapter 2? Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9. Here we go. But, say the next word with me. It's in bold letters. But you, he's saying you, insert your name, but Nate, but Bill, but Sally, your name, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, say the next three words, you are God's special possession. You're valuable to him. You're God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. When you have someone special in your life and you are the most important person in God's life, you are. If you weren't, he wouldn't have sent his son to die on the cross on behalf of your sins so that you could have a relationship with him. He loves you so much. 
When you have special people in your life, you want the very best for them. You want to steer them away from bad stuff, and you want to steer them towards anything that would help them succeed. So with that in mind, I want to talk about things that are fun, okay? Today is Halloween, okay? And so a lot of you, how many have already eaten some of the Halloween candy that you purchased for the children? Go ahead and raise your hand if you've done that. We were hitting it pretty hard last night. So hopefully if you come to my house tonight, we have enough candy left. I'm gonna have to make another trip to the store. But I was getting a little nostalgic about Halloween. I thought about how much I love each and every one of you. And I thought, you know what? I'm gonna make you guys some brownies. And so I've got a sample brownie here, but we've got more that are in the lobby. That's a little gift from me to you. Put together the batter. We got the great icing. We even, I even added the Halloween sprinkles. Can you see that? You see the Halloween sprinkles on there? It's really, really awesome. And now I need a taste tester. I need someone to take a bite. Let everybody know how good it, there you go. Come on up here, Nick. Thank you very much. I'm glad that you did that. This is Nick Becker. Give him a round of applause. He's actually better than me at ping pong, which just makes me so mad. And he's also better at golf. Okay, take a bite. Take a, take a spoon fill. Before you take the bite, okay, get it on the spoon there. I want you to know that I made this very lovingly and carefully for someone like you, okay? And it's got my special ingredients and my special recipe and I even added something really wonderful. Let's show the next slide here. Look at the picture. See that picture right there? That's my dog, Simba. He's a good looking animal, isn't he? Needs a haircut. But nonetheless, Simba helped in the participation in the process. Simba dropped a little deuce out in our yard and I went ahead and I got a little piece of it and I threw it in the batter. How comfortable are you taking? Don't do it, oh my gosh. <laughs> you knew I was lying, right? You, you, okay. That's how, much, that's how much trust he's got. And just to be clear, so we don't get sued online or anything, there is no dog poop in the brownie. There is no dog poop in the brownie. But if there was a little bit, would you have eaten it? Yeah. You probably would have, which is totally ruining my illustration for today. So just, no, you wouldn't, right? Give Nick a round of applause. You could take that brownie with you if you could. Is anybody comfortable eating a brownie that's got dog poop in it? What if it's just a little bit? No amount of dog poop in brownie batter should be consumed by anyone. That is ridiculous. And so is some of the garbage we put in our life on a regular basis. So let's look at what God has to say to us. First Peter chapter 2, verse 1. He says, Therefore, say the next two words with me, Therefore, that wasn't very good because I know it's going to be hard to hear this, but let's just, we got to go through this first part to get to the next part. Therefore, say it with me, rid yourself. Get rid of all malice and all deceit and all hypocrisy and all envy and all slander of every kind. Let me define each one of those. Malice is where you have ill will for another person that you desire to injure them. And you think, well, I would never do that. Have you ever thought about it in your heart? Last week, I was watching the Bears and Packers game. I felt like the Bears maybe had a chance. Silly me. The Packers won, and there was a big point. Yeah, wait, hold on. I've got something really important for you here. Uh, they won, and, and there was a crucial point of the game where their quarterback, Aaron Rodgers, scored a touchdown, and then he screamed into the, to the fans for everyone to hear, and they got it on the mic, and he said, I, do you know what he said? He said, I own you. And then he said, I blanking own you. And I heard that. And I turned to the guy who's a part of our church who I'm really trying to work you know, into and try to encourage him in his faith. And I said, you know what? We should kill him. <laughs> That's what I said. Not like we should hit him hard. I was like, let's just knock him out and take him to the hospital and kill him. So I need to work on this. <laughs> in a very significant way, and my guess is you might need to also. If you have things in your life where you desire someone to be hurt, you're eating dog poop. Deceit, willfully fooling someone else or yourself. You rely on expense report? You ever felt the FAFSA form wrong? You ever add a little bit to a story to make yourself look better? That's deceit. 
And God says, I want you to get rid of all that stuff because it's going to eat you alive. Hypocrisy, acting one way on the outside, knowing full well you aren't that way on the inside. Just telling everybody else to do stuff when you know as soon as you get home, you're going to do it also. Envy is being not just jealous of someone, but like you want bad things to come their way because they've got something you don't have. Slander is intentionally tearing down other people with our words. But just take a moment and think about those definitions. And I'll be pretty blatantly honest with you. I struggle with all of them. And they have no place in my life. And God says, I care about you. I love you. You're my special possession. Get rid of that stuff. Not just a little bit of it. Not just some of it. Get rid of all of it all of it so that you can do the next part number two you can fill yourself with the good stuff like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation don't just be a 30 year old christian who's still a preschooler let's grow up let's mature now that you have tasted that the lord is good. So in our online experience earlier, this was actually pretty funny. We have a wonderful online, we have a bunch of online hosts, and Kaylee was the online host, and she put a little uh, mask on me, and she said, okay, I want you to taste the dum-dums and give me the flavor. The first flavor that she gave me was cherry, and I guessed grape, (laughs) okay? Very embarrassing. The next one she gave me, I forget what it was, I had it completely wrong. She said, it's pineapple, and I was like, I For whatever reason, either my taste buds are bad, which by the way, I don't have COVID, so don't go there. I know a lot of you are thinking that. I could taste it, okay? But like the initial taste, I couldn't figure it out, but once I chomped on it and I chewed on it a little bit, I'm like, oh yeah, that's what it is. We've got to crave the good stuff and we've got to have it be in our life regularly. We've got to taste it so that we can recognize it and feel it and know it. Um, In 25 days, I'm going to crave something very important in my life. What is it? Say it again. Turkey. And I like to have the mashed potatoes and gravy and the corn all mixed up together. Is anybody else like that? You put the corn in the mash. How many of you keep the corn separate? Go ahead and put your, raise your hand. Good for you. You're still going to heaven, maybe, but I'm not sure why you do that. You got to put it in there with it, okay? And the rolls, it's just wonderful. We crave the good stuff. So how do you grow? The way that this series started is we were in life group one night and we were sitting around and we, were, we actually were watching a Right Now Media clip and then we were, we were talking about it in my living room and uh, we were going around the circle with a particular question and this guy just said, listen, I don't know how to be a follower of Jesus. I know I'm supposed to go to church. I can do that. I know that I'm supposed to be in a life group. I've done that. I see the benefit. But what do I do the rest of the week? I don't know how. You ever feel like that? You ever have that question? That's why we did this series. Because we want to let you know how. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk. Do children eat like once a week? No. They eat all the time. They eat all the time, and the older they get, the more they eat, and the bigger they grow. There's nothing more precious than holding a baby, feeding it a bottle, and just imagining what that little baby is going to grow up to be. Because babies become toddlers, they start walking. Toddlers become preschoolers, they start talking and learning. Preschoolers become elementary school students, where they start learning math, and they start to read. They start to figure it out, then they become junior hires, and you're like, Ah, they're in junior high. What are we going to do, right? Their bodies change. They become high schoolers. And then they grow up and they start dating people and they get married and the process repeats itself. We're not surprised at all by growth. It's natural. But you've got to feed yourself. So how do you regularly feed yourself? Obvious answer is you've got to be in the Scripture. So I want to talk about that just for a second. If you do not own a Bible, would you come up to me afterwards? I'll make sure you get one. Okay? Just let me know. We'll get you a Bible. One that you can understand. 
If you, I'm going to ask you to pull your phones out again. Okay, I'm going to try to be as applicable as I can. I'm going to guess that you, have, you might have the YouVersion Bible app on your phone. If you don't, I want to encourage you to download it. It's free, and it's, I'm not trying to sell it for them. There's been over 500 million people on planet Earth who have downloaded it. Okay, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Just type in the Bible or type in YouVersion Bible app. Once you download that, you're going to have all kinds of different ways in which you can grow in your relationship with Christ, okay? You've got a little button that's going to come up at the bottom that's going to say, read. That's going to be the Bible. So you can just quickly scan throughout the Bible on your phone, which is kind of cool. You also have a little button that says plans. Whenever you click on plans, you can search any devotion you can imagine. And you can have it go right to your phone every day. And there's a scripture verse, and there's an application question. And then you can invite other friends. It's like social media. You get to choose who you want to be friends with. And then every day you can do a scripture with that other person. So right now I'm currently doing this with a guy that's pretty new in his faith. And he picked the plan the first time. I picked the plan the second time. The first plan he picked was three days. The next plan I picked was 30 days. (laughs) And now it's his turn again. And every morning he reads a scripture and he puts in the talk it over. So he reads the scripture. Here's the application point. Here's what he writes down. Here's what I think this means. Here's how I'm going to try it out. And then I write back and I say, yeah, I think you've got it. I think you can do it. Here's what I'm going to try to do. Let's hold each other accountable. And we grow every day. Every day we're in the scripture. I talked to you about writing on media earlier. I want to encourage you. I didn't add this in the first service. I want to add it this one. I want to challenge you for the next 30 day to be in the scripture. Not just reading it, but actually applying it, okay? And you can choose that, and we're going to help you with that. If you need help at the end, I'm going to help you with that, okay? I probably will do a video tomorrow. I'm going to just make that same. I'm going to do a video tomorrow. If you need help, I'm going I'm to figure that out and show you step by step how to do that. But here's the thing I also want to encourage you with, okay? 30 days. Next 30 days, I want you to expose yourself to the Scripture every day. The ne- other thing I want you to do is anytime you're in the car... I want to challenge you for the next 30 days to only listen to Christian radio. That's it. 104.7 is WBGO. 89.7 is WONU. And Caleb is 90-something-something. Something. I don't know why I can't remember. It's in my car. Does anybody know what the call number is for Caleb out of Chicago? I got like three different numbers here, so I'm not going to say it's one of the 90s, okay? I think it's 97 something, but it could be 94. I don't know. I should know that. I should be better prepared. I apologize. Imagine, imagine what God would do in your life if every time you're in a car, you're exposing yourself to his truth instead of the other stuff. And imagine what he would do in your life if every day of your life you're exposing yourself to his scripture. You're ridding yourself of the bad stuff. You're filling yourself with the good stuff. And you're beginning to grow. You're beginning to grow. So here we go. Let's recap it. And we're going to give you the third one right here. The number one, you rid yourself. The number two, you fill yourself. And the third thing that you do is you base yourself. The next four verses are all about getting our life anchored to the right cornerstone in our life. 1 Peter 2, 4 says, As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God, and, say the next word, and precious. See, he's telling you again how much he loves you. You're precious and you're chosen. Verse 5, You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So none of this happens on our own. It all happens as we work through Christ Jesus in our life. God wants to build you up into something really specific. First Peter chapter 2 verse 6, the next verse here it says, for in scripture it says, see I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him, say the next five words, and the one who trusts in him, say it with me, ready? Will never be put to shame. That's huge. Now, we have a subdivision that's going on around us, and there's going to be a whole bunch of homes that are going to go all the way around this particular property. And I love that. Because I get to walk as soon as those homes open. I say, hey, I'm Nate. We're right over. Come on over. We'd love to have you. We'd love to encourage you. We'd love to help you. We like it. We love it. Now let's imagine, and you can notice this as you leave today. If you're watching online, just imagine this in your brain. 
that as they're putting the foundation in, if they've got the side walls and one wall's a little higher than the other, are they gonna have a problem with the building process? Yes or no, right? You know that thing, I'm not too technologically sound when it comes to construction, but I believe there's a thing called a level, right? It's got the little bubble in the middle. You know what I'm talking about? And if the bubble's not in the middle, what happens? You got a problem. It's gotta be square, it's gotta be even. You gotta base your life on the right thing. Because if you base it on anything other than Christ Jesus, it's not gonna work. It's gonna be uneven. And it's gonna cause all kinds of problems, which is exactly pretty much what the next couple of verses say. The next scripture says this, now to you who believe this stone is precious, it makes sense, it's the level, but to those who do not believe, it's the stone the builders rejected, which has now become the cornerstone. So everybody, I reject that. And we're like, actually, no, this is the key to life. You gotta build your life around this. If you don't, verse eight, here's what happened, a stone that causes people to stumble and it's a rock that makes them fall. Because you can't anchor your life to something that's wrong. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. And I wanna be super clear on this, right? If you think you can like do it your way and against God, it's destined for failure. He doesn't want that for you. He loves you, he cares about you, he wants the very best for you. But if you're gonna do it his, your way instead of his way and disobey anything that he's gotta say, you got problems coming. You just do. Just like in our kids, we love them. We want the very best for them. And we're like, don't do this because you're going to see it crash over here. And I was a kid once and I'm like, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> and then we learn our lesson. And thankfully we have a God who has grace. And he loves us in spite of our willful disobedience to him. And he receives us back with open arms. Here we go, here's the four things that we're talking about today. They're all action steps, all things we need to do. We rid ourselves of the bad stuff. We don't have any poopy stuff in our life, okay? We fill ourselves with the good stuff. And I'm challenging you right now, those watching online, if you're watching later, you can you know, adjust this, but I'm saying, what if we took the next 30 days and made sure we were in the scripture, applying it, and anytime we were in our car, we were listening to good stuff instead of bad stuff. What do you think God might do in and through your life? I dare you to try it, because I'm gonna do it. Number three, base yourself. Base yourself in the cornerstone that's level and perfect and pure. Anchor yourself to the one who wrote the book, the manual for how to live, how to live your life, and then remind yourself of who you are. First Peter chapter two, verse nine says this, we began with this scripture today. I want to remind you with it. We're beginning with it. We're ending with it. But you are a, say the next two words, you are a chosen people. He picked you. Anybody ever get picked last or next to last on the schoolyard? Anybody ever experience that? Anybody ever explain how, how humiliating that is? I hated that. I hated feeling unworthy that no one wanted me to be on their team. In your relationship with God, you are never to feel that way. Because the Bible says, I pick you. You are a, say it one more time, just so you get it, right? But you are a chosen people. He's chosen you. You are a royal priesthood. There's royalty in you. Now, I always get a little enamored with the silliness of the royal family in England, right? Everybody's like, oh, I want to be a prince and a princess. Have you watched any documentaries on their lives? Those people are weirdos. They're completely mixed up. I don't want anything to do with that. But I want to be reminded that I'm a child of the king, the king of the world, the king of creation, that he chooses me and I have been adopted into his family. There's royalty. I'm a holy nation. You are a holy nation. 
One more time. Say the next three words. Ready? You are God's special possession. I said that kind of quietly to try to emphasize it, but that seems stupid to sing it quietly. We should like shout that. Ready? Let's say it with a lot of gusto. Ready? We are, one, two, three, God's special possession. You're important to him. You matter to him. He loves you more than you could possibly comprehend. He chooses you. He brings you into his family as royalty. You're holy. He makes you holy. He says, you're like my grandchild. You're so precious to me. So that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Let's talk about darkness and light just for a moment. Years ago, uh, I was a student minister my first 10 years of ministry, and I loved it. High school students, junior high students. One of the things that we would... ...or a slab... We put up walls that actually had, you know, wood and different things. We'd insulate it a little bit. We'd give them electricity. And it took about five to six days was the process. And if you can imagine 40, 50, 60 high school students and, you know, a group of adults trying to kind of supervise this, it was a little nutty. It was a little sweaty because we always went in the summer. And we'd get back in the evening time and we'd have to say to the students, like, hey, it's time to shower because you guys stink. You know, it's like, let's go. We need to get in the shower. So the first time someone walks into the shower, uh, which by the way, like we're outside, there's a lid on the shower, but you like have the church area here and there's like this courtyard. There's like a little door that you'd open. There's two showers and they were kind of like, if you can just imagine like bricks kind of going straight up in a box. And we walked in and there were cockroaches, no lie, about that big running around. So can you imagine taking a shower and having one of those run up your leg? You, you know, just kind of like, and you're taking a shower. So it's not the most, so all the girls are like, we're not taking showers. And all the guys were like, yeah, if the girls aren't going to do it, we're not going to do it. And we're like, we all know you guys are afraid of the cockroaches. So am I. They're massive. So our guide said, here's how we're going to handle this situation. There's three flashlights. Go in to the shower, turn the water on and shine those flashlights everywhere. What happens when you shine light on cockroaches? Where do they go? They go away, they leave. What happens if you keep the light on them? They stay away and you can take a shower and you can get clean. You may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful, say it with me, into his wonderful light. Shine a light on it. Shine a light on your sin. Rid yourself of it. You're not going to rid yourself of it if you're not honest about what it really is. You're not. You're going to justify it. You're going to hide it. You're going to bury it. You're never going to deal with it. And you're going to eat dog poop. And it's going to erode your soul. Or, or, you can be reminded that you're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, and that you can declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness by actually shining a light on it. Last verse, and then we're going to go right to our conclusion. Last verse, it says, once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. So act like it. Once you have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy, so act like it. Here's your action steps very quickly. One, two, three, four. What do I need to get rid of? Not what does your neighbor get, need to get rid of. Not what does is, what is your children need to get rid of. Because you can obviously see it in their life. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about you, and I'm talking about me. That's why I put the thing, what do I need to get rid of? What do I need to shine a light on? We're getting real serious today. We do not want to walk out of here 
and ignore the actual sin in our life. We need to get rid of it. And you might think, well, it's just a small blah, blah, blah. So it's a little bit of small dog poop. It's still a little bit of small dog poop. It's garbage. It's time to get rid of it. You got to expose it to the light. What do I need to fill myself with more of? What is it? 30 days. Let's go. Let's do this together. 30 days. Let's fill ourselves with the good stuff. Not just on Sunday, not just on Wednesday night for group. Every day. Every time we get in the car, every time we wake up, we're filling ourselves with the good stuff. I build my life on I build it on Christ because he's the cornerstone and I'm continually reminded of who I am in relationship to him I was putting this message together this week and I was driving home one night and I was actually listening to Christian radio which I got to be honest I don't normally do I usually listen to talk radio and just get angry (laughs) how dumb am I I heard this song The song title is Look What You've Done. And it's all about this impression of who God is, that God's coming at us with a fly swatter or a hammer saying, look what you've done. You've done it wrong. You're wrong. You're bad. Here's shame. Live in that. It's not who God is. It's not who God is. God looks at you and says, you're his special possession. You're a holy people. You're a royal priesthood. You're chosen. And the author of this song changed that phrase, look what you've done, instead of it, God, you're out to get me, to God, look what you can do in and through me. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes. I want you to block out anything that's going on in your world right now, and I want you to think about what do you need to get rid of, what do you need to fill yourself up with, how do you need to look at the presence and power of God in your life, and as you're thinking about that, listen to these words. Look what you've done Look what you've done How could you fall so far? You should be ashamed of yourself So I was ashamed of myself The lies I believed I got some roots let him take hold of my life Let him take control of my life Soon in your presence, Lord, I can feel you taking all our roots up I feel you healing all my wounds up All I can say is hallelujah Look what you've done Look what you've done to me You spoke the truth to me 